Psalms 104. We're going to begin reading verse number 1. The Bible says, Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord my God, thou art very great. Thou art clothed with honor and majesty, who covers thyself with light as with a garment, who stretcheth out the heavens like a curtain, who layeth the beams of his chambers in the waters, who maketh the clouds his chariot, who walketh upon the wings of the wind, who maketh his angels spirits, his ministers a flaming fire, who laid the foundations of the earth that it should not be removed forever. Let's pray. Our Father, we bless you. Thank you for your goodness and your mercy. Thank you for the good testimonies, the good singing. Lord, we're thankful for that robe of righteousness wherewith we've been robed because we've been washed in the blood of Jesus, justified by faith, sealed by the Spirit of God, and whereby we cry, Abba, Father, because we received the adoption of sonship. God, we're blessed tonight, and we're thankful we can come to the house of God. Now, bless these thy people. Lord, many of them have labored hard this week on their jobs. Many of them have faced adversity. And Lord, they've found themselves in the house of God tonight. And I pray you'd bless them and you'd help them and you'd encourage them. Uh, now, Father, uh, 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 bless the reading of the Word of God. Uh, use this unworthy vessel. Bring unto my remembrance those things that, Lord, you showed me from the Scriptures. Uh, and, Father, just uh, uh, have your will away. If there's somebody here tonight lost, I pray, Lord, you'd convict them and save them. Uh, God, if there's somebody here tonight saved, but they're just not where they should be, uh, I pray that, Lord, uh, they'll come to themselves and get it made right tonight. Uh, Lord, maybe there's somebody here tonight, uh, Lord, that's just low. I pray you'd lift them up. Uh, somebody just struggling, I pray you'd help them. Uh, Lord, somebody may be seeking, I pray they'd find the answers they're seeking. Uh, God, just uh, move accordingly in the service. Uh, God, I pray nobody would hinder, uh, nobody would be a stumbling block. Uh, I pray the sweet Holy Ghost of God be allowed to do his office work. Uh, Father, we bless you and praise you for what you do. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Uh, amen. Uh, amen. Here we find the psalmist. Uh, just bragging on the Lord. You know, I say that's an easy target with the Lord. You can't help but brag upon him. You can't help but talk about how great he is. You can't help but say I find no fault in him. You can't help but say he's far better to me than I've ever been to him. And you can't help but say he's the best thing that ever happened in my life. And so we find the psalmist bragging on the Lord. Notice uh, as he's bragging and talking on the Lord, uh, notice he mentions the Lord's majesty uh, in verse number 1. Uh, he says, Bless the Lord, O my soul. Uh, o Lord my God, thou art very great. Uh, thou art clothed with honor uh, and majesty. Uh, uh, can I say, uh, 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 that crowd over there in England, uh, they uh, uh, put on pumps and circumstance, uh, and they say they're majestic, uh, but there's nobody with the majesty uh, of the Lord Jesus uh, and Him uh, and His majesty on high. Uh, can I say, uh, He didn't have to aspire to being majestic. Uh, he's always been majestic. Uh, can I say the psalmist says uh, He's clothed in majesty. Uh, can I say, uh, uh, He's clothed in majesty uh, and honor. Uh, they're the very... Uh, 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 garments that he adorns uh, is majestic. Uh, uh, when John saw him uh, uh, there in uh, Revelation chapter 1, uh, he said uh, he was so majestic, uh, I fell on my face before him as a dead man. Uh, uh, can I say uh, the Lord uh, is high lifted up, uh, and the earth is his footstool, uh, and he is majestic above all things tonight. Uh, we see that he's clothed in majesty. Yeah. Notice he also mentions his covering. Look in verse number 2. He said, Who covers thyself with light, as light as with a garment. Can I say the Lord is so majestic, uh, uh, he is transcended by light uh, and glory. Uh, uh, can I say uh, 
Uh, he doesn't need somebody to turn on the light. Uh, he is the light. Uh, and can I say, when it comes to New Jerusalem, uh, he'll be the light of the city. Uh, there's no need of a sun, uh, no need of a moon, uh, no need of a Duke Power Company, because uh, Jesus is the power, uh, and he's the light, uh, and he's covered with light. Uh, we see he's clothed in majesty. He's covering his light. Uh, notice his customs. Notice when it comes to the Lord and how high and how great he is and how majestic he is. Notice his customs or his means and his methods. Look what it says uh, uh, in verse number 3. We find that ch his chambers are in the waters. It says, Who layeth the beams of his chambers in the waters? Can I say, uh, uh, he's simply saying that the beams uh, or the uh, very structure or trellises uh, of his chambers is in the waters. Now, can I say, uh, if you study that out, he's talking about the waters uh, of the heavenlies, the firmament, the atmosphere, where the rain comes from. Uh, 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 the Lord is so majestic uh, that in that heavenly arena, uh, he's got his chambers. Uh, uh, can I say that he got, talks about uh, uh, his chariot uh, is of the clouds. Uh, it goes on to say who's making the clouds his chariot. Uh, are you uh, uh, getting a grasp of this that God in his majesty uh, 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 takes up his abode in the heavenlies uh, and he rides on the clouds? Uh, 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 hey, listen, uh, the one who walked on the water uh, uh, rides on the clouds uh, uh, because he's so majestic uh, that the very clouds uh, that uh, cause men to tremble uh, or cause men to gawk at, uh, that's the very chariots of God. Uh, and then he goes on to talk about uh, 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 how he walketh uh, on the wings of the wind. Notice his course is the wind. The path he takes is found in the wind. Isn't it wonderful to be in a service uh, and all of a sudden uh, uh, you feel the wind of glory show up uh, and God comes walking in uh, as he walks on the wind, my dear friends. Uh, the psalmist is bragging on the Lord in his majesty. But then he mentions the Lord's ministers in verse number 4. He says, Who maketh his angels spirits, his ministers a flaming fire. Now years ago I preached on what's the big deal about angels. Is that where you went? There was somebody writing a book about angels. You seen bumper stickers, angels watching over me. People started collecting little angels. And they was all concerned about the angels. I said, what's the big deal about angels? Uh, I got the Lord Jesus Christ. Who needs any angels? But all angels are, are ministers or messengers of the Lord. And can I say he refers to his uh, uh, ministers of the gospel uh, as angels. In Revelation chapter 1, the pastors are referred to as angels of the church. Uh, but notice that doesn't mean we're angelic. Trust me, I got horns and the pitchfork goes with me most places. I go, well, but listen, that just means that we are a minister of the Lord. Uh, now notice what he said that his ministers would be uh, uh, as flaming fire. Uh, 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 what does that mean? Uh, that means when uh, a man of God gets a message from God uh, and he stands behind this sacred desk uh, and he gets filled with the Holy Ghost, uh, he's on fire from God and he delivers a message of fire. Uh, I'm going to give you a plug nickel for somebody who stands behind this sacred desk and they're boring and they can't, they can't even, you know, they put themselves to sleep. They're not a minister of the Lord. The Bible says that his ministers uh, are flaming fire. But look at this about his ministers. The ministers of God, whether we're talking about literal angels or whether we're talking about his messengers, his preachers, ministers of God uh, execute his commands. An angel never does his own will. He does the will of God. And a man of God worth his salt does what God says. Can I say this? His ministers embrace his call. Brother Josh thanks the Lord for his calling. Call to preach. Ministers of God embrace his call. I wouldn't give you a, a plug nickel for somebody who calls himself a preacher and they embrace the things of the world more than their call. Uh, the Apostle Paul wrote to Thessalonica and he wrote to another church that we are to be counted worthy of our calling. 
Now, we don't deserve any of the blessings of God, and there's not a man who ever stood and preached the Word of God that is worthy of that office or that title, uh, but God counted him faithful, put him in the ministry, uh, and therefore he ought to embrace that and do everything in his power not to disappoint the heart of God or disappoint the office God's called him to. And can I say this about ministers? Ministers enact his cause. Ministers put into action those things that God has said to do. Can I say, nowhere in Scripture you find God ever use anybody to sit down and do nothing. He calls them to put into action his cause. Did not David says, is there not a cause? Uh, so we see the Lord's ministers. We see the Lord's majesty. We also find the psalmist brags on the Lord's manifold works. Look down at verse 24. He says, O oh Lord, how manifold are thy works. If we'd have had time, we'd have read the chapter all the way down through here, and he talks about how God uses the sea and how God uses creation. All God done uh, 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 when he created this world and how he worked in the affairs of man, I mean, he said, how manifold are thy works. He said, how many and how great of things that you have done, God. I got to thinking about the Lord's work. Can I say the Lord's works are deliberate in construction. God doesn't do anything by accident or leave anything to chance. Amen. You've heard me say a million times, if it comes into your life, God allowed it. Amen. If you couldn't have handled it, God wouldn't have let it come your way. Right. He is deliberate in his works. He construction, constructs his works deliberately. He allows things to come in your life deliberately. Sometimes He allows things to come in your life to better you. Sometimes He allows things to come into your life to break you. Sometimes He allows things to come into your life that has nothing to do with you at all. He's wanting to use you to help somebody else. But God has a reason for everything He allows to come into our lives. Can I say His manifold works? They're deliberate in construction. Can I say this? They're distinct in their purpose. God didn't create a zebra to do the work of an elephant. God has a distinctive purpose for everything he does in his works. And can I say, God has churches all over this planet. He has distinctive works for each one of them. He has a distinctive work for our church. He has called us to this field of labor to distinctively work this field and to also get the gospel out in Samaria, Judea, and the other most parts of the world. Can I say this about his manifold works? They're designed for his glory. God never did anything just to do it. Everything he ever created was created to bring him glory. That's why the songbirds sing. They sing to the glory of God. That's why wolves howl at the moon. They do that to the glory of God. That's why opossums, you know, squander around in the night. They do that to the glory of God. Uh, I mean, everything God done, he done for a reason. And when people uh, uh, do what God created them to do, they'll bring glory to him. When the animal kingdom does uh, what God designed for them to do, they bring glory to him. Uh, when plants grow, they bring glory to him. Uh, everything that God created was designed to bring glory to him. Now, when man chose to sin, this world became cursed and thorns and thistles and weeds and all those things came and they attacked creation. That's why Romans chapter 1 tells us the creation itself groans for the coming of the Lord to right all the wrongs. But creation, everything about it was designed for God's glory. He mentions the manifold works. And then the psalmist, in bragging on the Lord and talking about all the Lord, he ends this chapter with saying, The Lord's so great, and His works are so wonderful. He said, I'm just going to stop and meditate on it for a little bit. Look at verse 34. He said, My meditation of Him shall be sweet. I will be glad in the Lord. And notice what meditation is all about. Can I say there's the sacrifice in order to meditate? If you're going to meditate, you've got to do that on purpose. You've got to set aside time. You've got to uh, uh, put yourself in the right frame of mind to think on the Lord, think about the goodness of the Lord, think on the Word of God, and all those things you've got to have your mind set on the affections of God. There's a sacrifice for that. 
If you're not careful, you just say, well, I'm going to meditate on the Lord. Next thing you know, your mind's running somewhere else. Amen. So there's a sacrifice in keeping your thoughts under subjection to meditate on the goodness of God. And can I say, once you have sacrificed to meditate, we find that there, are, there is sweetness revealed in meditations. Look what it said in verse 34. My meditation of him shall be sweet. Anytime you think on the Lord and his goodness and all of his works and all that he does, you know what you have to do? You just have to say, the Lord is good. He's good all the time. You have to say, he's sweeter than the honeycomb. And because the Lord is sweet. It comes with sweetness. When you think on the goodness of God, you can't help but feel the sweetness of God in all that he does. You can't help but look around and say, I'm blessed. Hmm? But then notice what else he reveals in verse 34. He also reveals that satisfaction is found in meditation. He said, my meditation of him shall be sweet. I will be glad in the Lord. Amen. He's saying, I'm satisfied. I, I found gladness when I think about the Lord. Hmm? Can I say, when you lean under the Lord's understanding, you'll be happy. Yes. You'll be glad. When you think on anything that is lovely, anything of good report, anything of virtue, you know what it does? It brings gladness to your soul. You know why? Because there's so much negativity in this world. But when you think on the pure things of God, it brings satisfaction and gladness to your soul. Isn't all that wonderful? I'm not going to preach on any of it. What I'm interested is down, found it down in verse 16. In verse 16, the Bible says this. The trees of the Lord are full of sap, the cedars of Lebanon, which he had planted. And can I say, the Bible has a lot to say about trees. Can I say, trees represent a lot of things in Scripture. Can I say, first of all, they represent power. When you find trees, you find something of power. When we think of those mighty red oaks out there in California, I've never seen them with the naked eye, but when they got, got them big enough for tum tunnels and you drive through them, that's a pretty powerful tree. I think it stood there for hundreds of years and all the storms it's faced and it's still standing. Hmm? I was watching that hurricane hit down there in Florida and I'm watching them crazy newsmen stand outside. And I mean, the wind's blowing them sideways and them trees are bent over, but you know what? Them trees are still standing. Hmm? Uh, they represent power. The powerful force they endured, 150 mile an hour winds, and they're still standing. Can I say in Scripture, trees represent production. They're known by what they produce. Here it mentions the mm, trees of Lebanon. Mm, those are cedar trees. And those were very important. As a matter of fact, uh, 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 the tabernacle of Solomon was built with cedar, mm, not only for its aroma, but for its beauty. I remember one time Brother Ray built a, a cabin down there on Williamstown Lake and uh, the ceiling was all tongue and groove cedar. It was beautiful, smelled wonderful and uh, it's known for that production. Fruit trees are known for the fruit they bear. So trees are known for power. They're known for pr production. But trees also in Scripture uh, represent the people of God. Can I say this? Let's look at that. We find in verse 16, it says, The trees of the Lord are full of sap, the cedars of Lebanon, which he hath planted. Can I say, anybody that's in God's family was planted in God's family. Amen. You weren't born a natural Christian. You was conceived in iniquity and in sin did your mother bring you forth. You was a sinner by birth, a sinner by practice, a sinner by nature, right? And you had to be born again. Uh, and the moment you was born again, God placed you in the family of God. Uh, you were planted into the family of God. Uh, you are now in God's vineyard. Uh, you are part of God's family. Uh, hey, aren't you glad uh, you were transplanted from a world of sin uh, and from a life of doom uh, and from an eternity in hell uh, and you were transplanted uh, into the things of God. Uh, you are now saved, uh, safe, uh, and you have an eternity of glory and bliss because uh, of the new birth. Uh, you've been planted in the things of God. Uh, 
But can I say something else about the people of God? We not only notice the planning, uh, but notice their purpose. In the psalmist, uh, in uh, chapter number 1, verse number 1, the Bible says this, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth by the way, in the way of the sinners, uh, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, uh, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, uh, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Uh, verse 3, And he shall be like a tree, uh, planted by the rivers of water, uh, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. Uh, his leaf also shall not wither, uh, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Uh, how can I say? Uh, uh, it shows the purpose uh, of a child of God uh, is to bring forth fruit. Uh, we just preached a few weeks ago uh, over there in John 15. It is ordained of God uh, that we bring forth much fruit. Uh, God saved us uh, in order to make a difference uh, in this world uh, and in other people's lives. Uh, and we are being provoked uh, under the glory of God. Uh, that's our purpose, to bring forth fruit. So trees are planted. Christians are planted. Trees have a purpose. We have a purpose. And can I say this about the people of God and representation of trees? Mm, there's prosperity. Amen. Mm, verse number three, it says, Whatsoever you do shall prosper. Can I say, if you are living and walking in the will of God and doing the will of God, you can't help but succeed. Amen. You say, what if nobody gets saved? You're still a success because you told them. Yay. You did your part. Amen. Uh, what if uh, all the world turns against you? Well, they did Jeremiah, they did Jesus, they did a bunch of men in the, wor in the Word of God. So, hey, hey they were, that's put you in good company. But look again at verse 16. The trees of the Lord are full of sap. Full of sap. They prosper. They're full of sap. A tree without any sap or with little sap is not a very, very good tree. Matter of fact, it looks like it's dead. The only thing keeping it from being dead is the little bit of sap that's running through it. But you show me a tree full of sap. And I'll show you a tree that's flourishing. I'll show you a tree everybody looks at and says, wow, look at that tree. I'll show you a tree that gives off oxygen to help folks around and sends forth a cool breeze. I'll show you something that's worth hanging around. A tree full of sap. That's what I want to preach on for a little bit tonight. I want to preach on sappy Christians. Uh, you need to be full of sap. You need to be sappy. I mean, if, if Phil Robertson could be happy, 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 shouldn't we be sappy, sappy, sappy? Huh? We should. You ought to be full of sap tonight. Uh, so we need to be sappy Christians. Can I say what that sap shows? First of all, the sap shows spiritual fruit. The sap represents the Spirit of God. Uh, and can I say, uh, uh, the Bible says, uh, be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, uh, but be ye filled uh, with the Spirit. Uh, and what we need to do uh, is be filled with the Spirit. Uh, too many Christians live defeated lives because they're full of the world uh, or they're trying to be full of the devil. Uh, that doesn't work. Uh, you can't belong to the Lord be full of the devil. Uh, what we need to do is be full of the Lord. Uh, we need to be filled with the Spirit of God. Uh, we need to empty ourselves and divorce ourselves uh, from things of this world uh, and be filled with heavenly things. Uh, hey, it shows spiritual fruit. Uh, hey, you know what the fruit of the Spirit is? Uh, gentleness, goodness, meekness, temperance, uh, love, joy, peace. Uh, that's what we need to be filled with. Uh, a sappy Christian uh, is filled with the things of the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, and when folks see them, uh, they say, whoa, what a tree. Uh, oh, what a life. Uh, Oh, I'd love to have their life. Uh, it's amazing when you're a sappy Christian, even the world knows you're blessed. Even the world says, boy, you got a charmed life. It's amazing how many people think Miss Annette and I never have any problems and we live in a mansion. Uh, well, I do. I'm not there yet, but I got one. Yes, sir. Uh, the title was given to me that day I got born again. Are you listening? And I am blessed. I don't have any needs tonight. They've all been met in Jesus Christ. Huh? And see, a sappy Christian, that sap shows spiritual fruit. How sappy are you? 
I mean, I ought to run out of it. Now, listen, you ever been around a pine tree that's got sap all over it? You pick up pine cones, you got sap all over you, can't hardly get that stuff off of you? Uh, listen, they, they ought to see the sap oozing out of us. They, they ought to get close to us, get sap on them, huh? Now, not be able to wash it off or get away from it real easy. It ought to just go with them everywhere they go. Huh? So, boy, there's something about the love they show. Something about the kindness they show. Something about the sweetness about them. Uh, something about the forgiving spirit they got. Uh, something about the gentleness about them. Uh, something about just uh, uh, how they look at me and they care about me and they show me compassion. Uh, that's what they ought to walk away with when they get around us. Uh, Amen. See, a sappy Christian, that sap shows spiritual fruit. That sap shows a sweet countenance. Uh, you know, it didn't say... The trees of the Lord are full of prunes. Amen. Well, there's a lot of Christians look awful pruny. Right. Look at them and say, have a blessed day. Don't tell me what kind of day to have. Uh -uh. They smile, their face would crack. Anybody seen that, that one chocolate commercial that's out? I notice all the chocolate commercials. It's the one chocolate commercial, some Italian chocolates thing, and they're showing all these things going on in Italy and everything. The last lady they show, this lady has the worst set of wrinkles I've ever seen in my life. Remember that wrinkled dog? This lady makes that dog look like it's been ironed. I mean, she's got wrinkles on top of wrinkles on top, and she's eating this chocolate, and I'm thinking, I never want to eat chocolate again. <laughs> you can't tell me in all of Italy they can't find somebody looks better than that old woman eating the chocolate. She must own the com company. That's the only thing I can, I can assess, or, or she, she's the mother of whoever owns it. Uh, and I'm thinking, all these wrinkles and all these cracks and all this in her countenance, uh, that don't make me want her chocolate. Uh, hey, uh, when you look around at this crowd that claims they're going to heaven, uh, claims that they're saved, uh, claims that Jesus lives on the inside, uh, they uh, look miserable, they act miserable, they're always down in the dumps. Uh, I don't want what they got, uh, but you show me somebody uh, that's fought hell by the inch uh, and they still uh, got a sweet countenance uh, they still want to say blessed be the name of the Lord uh, they still want to live right uh, do right uh, they got a song in their heart uh, hey uh, I want to hang out with that person uh, mm, a sappy Christian's got a sweet countenance regardless of what's going on because their life is not controlled by their circumstances. Their life is controlled by the sap. You get full of Jesus, you can't help but be sweet. Because he's sweet. Can I say this? Sappy Christians, that sap shows a soulful joy. That's one thing to put on a false face. Most of you don't know my friend Paul Thompson. Paul's a nut. Paul needed to be in a padded room a long time ago. Paul's one of the greatest guitarists I've ever known. He plays that Chet Atkins finger pick style. And Brother Paul and I used to go to church with Brother Pittman's together. And he's a nut. Brother Pittman gave him the announcements, and Paul be sitting right next to me. Brother Pittman say, Pray for so and so. And Paul would look at me and say, I ain't going to do it. Just to get me tickled. And Brother Pittman knows something's going on. I was the one that always got caught. It's kind of like in football. The guy who retaliates always gets caught. I was the one that always got caught. But I'll never forget. I was preaching revival. But Sister Tina was just a teenager. I was preaching revival down there at Pleasant View. And Paul came. Him and his wife came to go with us. And he, he came and they got Paul up to sing. It's funny. He, he, he was hurrying from work, and he got his guitar, and he got his wife, got down to our house, and he said, Brother Doug, I forgot my Bible. Uh, don't laugh. If you've ever been in a hurry, you might have forgot yours too. He said, you got a Bible I can borrow? So I gave him, I had, I had a loose-leaf Bible. Now, if you don't know what that is, it's kind of like when you open a notebook, all the pages are loose. They're not bound into the Bible. And it's funny. Right before they caught him up to sing, that Bible popped open, half of it ended up on the floor. He's like, oh, no. I'll never get this thing put back. He's panicking. Say, get him up to sing. And he gets up and he said, okay, everybody put your smiles on. He's got a tongue depressor and, and stuck to it is the Joker from Batman's smile. And he puts it up to his face and there's this big smile everywhere and everything. But see, it was false. That's what a lot of people do. It's kind of like that, that depressed commercial where everybody goes away and they got the, the little happy face on, but they're not happy. 
And see, when you come to church that way, or when you go to work that way, or when you go to school that way, or you go to over your neighbors uh, uh, that way, they know if you've got a real smile or not. But a sappy Christian has soulful joy. When you're happy down in your soul, you don't need a false face. It just beams off of you. Are you listening? We ought to have a soulful joy. A sappy Christian has soulful joy. I mean, you, you just can't help but be happy. I mean, I, I, let's think about it. All that ever happened to you is Jesus forgave all your sin. Uh, your past is gone. Uh, he's only promised you eternal life. So he's only promised you to be a king and priest with him, rule and reign with him, give you a new Jerusalem, walk on streets of gold, gates of pearl, walls of jasper. Uh, I, I mean, what's really to be all down depressed about? huh? You know those that are depressed because you spend too much time looking around this world. I got news for you. We're in the world, but not of the world. Uh, get over there in Hebrews 11. Get to thinking right, like Abraham did. We're just pilgrims passing through. Are you listening? Sure. Yeah. Sappy Christians have a soulful joy. That sap also shows the Savior's love is present. You know one, one statement I hate? Well, because I'm saved, I've got to love you. That don't mean I have to like you. You show me chapter and verse for that. No, we're to esteem others better than ourselves. We're to forgive others because God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven us. We're to love one another. Are you listening? But to love like Christ loves. See, Christ, when they was nailing him to the cross, cried, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. I mean, when, when you are full of sap, it shows his love is present. His love is not easily offended. His love loves far beyond somebody's condition because he looks beyond the fault and sees the need. And see, when you're full of sap, you love like Jesus loves. doesn't matter what, where somebody comes from or what they do. What matters is what Jesus can do for them. Sappy Christian shows the Savior's love is present. Boy, we ought to all have a burden to love more like Jesus loves. Mm -hmm. Mm. Sappy Christian, that sap shows a scriptural influence. You know, some people aren't real sappy because they don't get in the book. You spend time in the Word of God, you'll get real sappy. Because it shows a scriptural influence. Now, you may not understand all the Bible, but you hang around it enough, some of it's going to rub off on you, and some of it's going to get in you, and then it's going to start getting sticky all over you. Are you listening? It shows a scriptural influence. Uh, you know, it's so sad as people that have the right book but don't have any sap because they spend too, many, too much time concerned about the letter. You know what Paul said? The letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. Uh, a sappy Christian has a scriptural influence, but there's more than just the scriptures. The one who penned down the scriptures is doing the work in them. Are you listening? There's a difference. Let me say this. That sap shows a sympathetic understanding. Well, there was a time when I, I was quick to say, oh, they deserved it. And then God reminded me one day what I deserved. I didn't get what I deserved. I got forgiven. I got grace. I got mercy. I got forgiveness. I got the love of God. Uh, I deserved hell, but I got heaven. Uh, and see, when you're full of sap, you look at things different. You say, Brother Doug, they murdered seven people. Yeah, but the blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth from all sin. That don't mean they don't deserve the punishment, but their soul, oh, their soul can still be forgiven, and they can go to heaven. You have a sympathetic understanding. You're slow to judge instead of quick to judge, but you're quick to forgive. Listen, my dear friends, sappy Christians 
have a sympathetic understanding. I thought about this lastly. I know this is just a little simple message on Wednesday night. I just felt like we need a little sappiness. Well, there ain't been a lot of, a lot of heartache going on in this world. Oh, we've had storms and devastation. We've got a fat leader of a country threatening America. We got bombs bigger in that whole country. That guy's not real bright. You know, he makes them believe that he is a god. He's gonna he's gonna push the wrong button and he's gonna meet God. Huh? But how many other of those people over there are gonna suffer? I mean, this world's hard. I mean, you face things this world. One of the doctors told, told my wife the new Kroger's is getting ready to open in Union tomorrow. And they said today they're going to have all the meat marked down. So she said, let's go to Kroger's. We met Kroger's. There wasn't any meat nowhere in that place. There wasn't nothing in that place. It was a ghost town. Huh? I thought the hurricane hit Florence, man. I mean, there's nothing in the grocery store. Huh? I was wanting some meat real cheap. No. The only thing they had was some kind of uh, Parmesan crusted salmon beefed up, rolled up, pepperoni looking thing. I thought, pass. <laughs> and then she showed me this other stuff and I looked at it and said, not on a bet would I eat that stuff right there. <laughs> no way. Uh uh. Well, see, things are hard here. We was expecting to go get a blessing, fill up the freezer. Well, we left empty. Uh, now I know how some of these Methodists and Church of Christ people feel. They go to church and leave leave it empty, huh? <laughs> Bless God, go to church and eat filled up, huh? Well, I thought about that. I mean, it's, it's hard. It's rough. Come to church, we need some help tonight. I thought about this. That sap shows a submissive walk. Amen. See, you, you don't get full of sap if you aren't walking with the Master. That just shows you have a submissive walk. I love that old hymn, Where He Leads, I Will Follow. Uh, just going to follow him. If he stops, I'll just bump into him. Uh, it shows a submissive walk. Uh, see, the mindset of this day and age is my rights, my claim to myself, me, 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 I, I, I. Those people are never sappy. Uh, that crowd that only comes when I want to. You never see any sap on them. You know why? They're not submissive. But folks that are submissive, you know what happens? They get full of sap. Folks that just say, Lord, thy will be done. Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Lord, where do you want me to go? What do you want me to do today? And that crowd that just follows Jesus, does what Jesus says, you know what happens? He just loads them up with sap. Huh? Life's too short not to have sap. Uh, you know what comes from sap? Syrup. Try eating pancakes with that syrup. Try eating pancakes with that light syrup. That's why I don't want no watered down word of God. Give me the real thing. Uh, hey, that syrup comes from sap. Uh, you know what happens? The Lord, Lord knows how to how to handle your pancakes. Uh, he puts a little syrup on it. I'm trying to help you tonight. World may be hard. People may be ugly. You may face a lot of hardship and heartache, which are without excuse not to be full of sap. Because the difference is you don't look at people and you don't look at the world and you don't you don't you know base everything on what the world says to be. You just keep your eyes on Jesus. You just keep walking with Jesus. You just keep reading about Jesus. You just keep talking with Jesus. You just keep singing about Jesus. You just keep meditating on Jesus, and you can't help but be full of sap. What kind of world would this be if they saw a whole lot more sap and a whole lot less of us? Tell you what it would be. It would be sappy, sappy, sappy. That's what it would be. God help us get so full of sap that when folks come in here, they can't help but leave sticky. We ought to be full of sap. Let me ask you something. Have you meditated on the Lord like you should this week? 
Have you told him how marvelous his works are this week? Have you bragged on him to, 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 and, and talking with him about how much majesty he is and how great he is and all those things? If not, you probably don't have much sap. How much have you sung to him this week? Uh, how much have you read about him this week? How much have you talked with him this week? See, that's where the sap shows out. You can't make your own sap. But you can make yourself fall in love with Jesus over and over and over and over and over. And the more you love him, the Bible says draw nigh to him, he'll draw nigh to you. The closer he gets to you, the more sap you get all over you. The Bible again says in verse 16, the trees of the Lord are full of sap, the cedars of Lebanon which he hath planted. God help us to not just have some sap, to be full of sap, because then it runs out and affects others. God help us to bubble over with the goodness of God that others see how great Jesus is. All right, I'm done. Let's all stand. Brother Clint, get a song of invitation. Maybe you need to come thank him for some sap. Maybe you need to come and say, Lord, I need some more sap. Forgive me, Lord, for not being all I could be so you couldn't fill me with sap. Maybe tonight you just want to come and tell him you love him. Maybe you want to come pray for somebody. Maybe you laid something else on your heart. You just need to mind the Lord tonight. Whatever he says, you do it. But I know one thing. You never have enough sap. Even when you're full, it just runs over, and then he'll just fill you up some more. So as they're picking out a song, let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for the word of God. Lord, what a wonderful chapter we found. Lord, how wonderful you are, how great you are, and all your wonderful works and all that you do. And Lord, we can meditate on them, be filled with the sweetness of the Lord. And then, Lord, we find in the middle of that chapter, your trees are full of sap. God, I pray, Lord, we'd be full of so much of the things of God. Lord, it sticks on others. Now, God, have your way in this invitation. Bless these that have come to pray. Speak to hearts. Pray your will be accomplished. In Jesus' name we ask it all. Amen.